All right, what is up, my brothers? Uh, welcome to another episode of the Before the Trainwreck series. We're at number 82. And this one's on tuning into your intuition to higher, slow, fire, fast. And I got some really good examples for you guys tonight on this one. Uh, most of the um, show tonight will be dedicated to Q&A, though. So we'll probably rip through this 10, 15 minutes tops and then start taking some Q&A. Hey, what's up, Santiago? I like how Richard doesn't put up with technical difficulties. If you don't get your act together, you are out. Boom. That's right. That's how I roll, man. Um, so let's get right into this then. Uh, my book's out. It uh, was published, I think, last Wednesday or something like that. So I'm, I'm slowly but surely kind of tearing through the chapters. Um, I think a few of them I've more or less ripped through the specific details even with, up on the screen. But this one today... Um, this is quite a bit of a shorter chapter with just three main points that I want to cover. And I'm going to share some stories that are not in the book. Um, so if you want to grab it here, let me grab the link to the damn thing. I got to have these links ready here. I can't fire myself though, right, Santiago? All right, copy and paste. So if you want to grab it, there's a link. Uh, I just watched a shining review from a divorce lawyer. I posted it to Twitter, uh, Jonathan Noble, if uh, you recall the name. He's been on before the train wreck with me before. Uh, so divorce lawyer says, read it if you want to stay out of his office. Anyway, um, there's a lot more to it than just that, by the way. Um, so let's talk about hiring slow and firing fast. So I learned this lesson, I don't know, 2002 or so, almost 20 years ago when, um, my job as a manager was removed from me. Um, they spent a lot of time in this business specifically, uh, vetting people for skills, uh, testing them for skills, making sure the skills were maintained and upgraded as they needed to be depending on what products and services were added to, um, you know, the a la carte menu, if you will. But um, one thing that I learned from that, which I actually adapted and I use, use in my own business, I'm gonna share, no, share another story with that too, is you have to hire as slowly as you possibly can reasonably. And that goes for hiring people to work for you. That also goes for uh, friends that you invite into your inner circle. I've often said, you know, you got to draw a perimeter around yourself and the five most important people stay in there. Everybody else is on the outside of the perimeter. You might have further perimeters around that. But uh, if you're going to allow somebody into your inner circle, friends, a woman, women, whatever it is that you're doing, uh, employees, uh, I would look at employees the same way, to be honest with you, especially if you're running a small business, you have to be super careful with who you invite into your business, but you need to hire slowly. You need to vet them slowly. And then if you discover that they're wasting your time or that they are a detriment or they can possibly be an anchor in your life and not a sale, meaning they hold you back, you have to be very quick to remove them. Okay. You have to be good at firing fast. Uh, and I have two other examples with my own personal life with a dating scenario and a business partner that I had as well uh, after this lesson I learned from uh, the collection industry that I was in. One of the things that I did, by the way, um, which I implemented in my own business was when I would hire people, I would actually go through quite a bit to identify that they were a good candidate. And one of the tests that I would implement, I usually did this about a week after I hired them, actually. Um, this isn't something that you can do obviously with a girl you're dating or with friends. So for those of you that are entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs, this will be useful in your business. Um, but I learned this technique and I adapted it very, very quickly because I found it to be very effective. I'd hire them very slowly, do, do all the training. And about a week after I hired them, about a week after they had time, uh, at the task at hand, we're doing the job, we're in the office, interacted with people, we're using the systems. Uh, had an opportunity to work with management and see how they gelled. Um, I'd call them in my office and I'd sit them down and, you know, without any kind of warrant, I'd be like, hey, you know, how are things going? You know, you enjoying stuff? Yep, yep. And they'd always just nod their head, very grateful to be there, blah, blah, blah. And I'd say, how about if I give you $1,000 to quit the job right now, right? Um, and I would start bidding it. I think I would bid it up normally to about $2,000. Um, and for the most part, if I did a good job, hiring slowly and vetting them for the role. Most people would say, it doesn't matter what you offer me today. You could offer me $5,000. I wouldn't quit. Okay. I wouldn't take the money and go. This was basically a firing bonus. And what I wanted to do was I wanted to see if they really wanted to be there because somebody that really wanted to be there would again, turn around and say, it doesn't matter if you pay me three, five, ten thousand dollars $10,000. I don't care. I love this. I want to stay here. I like this company. I like what's, you know, what's going on here. 
I did have one person, I think the entire time who I suspected wasn't going to stay for very long. He was a younger kid uh, and he needed to be outdoors and work with his hands was what I figured out at the end of it. He was one of the early on ones that I made a mistake on. But um, yeah, he took, um, I don't know, maybe 1200 bucks and I sent him home. So the good part of that from my perspective and somebody out there might be going, well, that's stupid. Why would you pay somebody $1,200 to or fire them? Like, why wouldn't you just fire them? Because I want to see what their intention is with me and my business and how serious they are about being there. Because if they're not serious about being there and they're just there to collect a paycheck and they're going to bounce anyway in a few months time and waste my time and waste the time of my customers who they tend to form a good relationship with, I want them out now. I don't want them to linger around for a few months, maybe even potentially have to pay them considerably more uh, to get them out of the business because you've got to pay a severance package and there's all sorts of other costs that come out of that. So I used to call this offering people a bonus to quit and it worked very well. So you guys consider that if you know, you're know you running your own business. Uh, I found it very, very effective uh, separating the wheat from the chaff and making sure I got rid of people that did not want to be there we're not a good fit. Uh, and it saved me a lot of money in the long run. Um, let me just welcome the new member GT wholesale, GT wholesale. Is that like, uh, there's a, I have a kombucha drink that I have in my fridge from Costco. I think it's GT something other GT tonic. Anyway, welcome to the uh, channel guys. If you join the channel, uh, just the join button over there, you get access to the live chat. Also, a lot of these videos, they now get quite a few comments on them, so I don't have time to go through them all. But what I do is uh, every few days, I go through my comment section and I always respond to channel members. So there's a little icon there, so I know that you're a channel member, so you will always get a response. If you see a video and you're like, what does this mean, Rich? I will clarify for you. You can just throw a comment and I'll definitely find it. Um, okay, so back on this notion of intuition and tuning it and um, hiring slowly and firing quickly, Let's talk about the single mommy episode. This is a personal relationship. Um, you guys, if you've watched my channel for a while, you probably already know this, but I got involved dating a single mommy after my divorce. Um, I was with her for about three years. I think it was something like, I'm going to say three or four months of dating. She's like, you know, she did the standard. Hey, let's, uh, you know, my kids are asking who I'm texting. I'd like you to meet them, blah, blah, blah. One thing leads to another. Eight months later, I'm on a vacation with her and her kids. All right, stupid. Anyway, my spidey senses by that point, and you know anybody that's done this knows exactly what I'm talking about. But my spidey senses by that point were were like, hey, hey, dude, like you sure about this? You know, you really want to go on this trip? Is this a good idea? Uh, I'm not sure this can, you know, or will end well for you. And you just kind of like, ah, shut up. You know, you just kind of, you know, push it away because you think you know everything. Um, you know, especially a guy like me, I just you know, doing all the things that I had done and, and, and solving all the problems that I had solved in my life and my business and all that sort of stuff. I was like, ah, yeah, whatever. Single mommy with the kids, no problem. I can deal with these guys. But no, no. Um, I had a lot of signs and signals in the leading up to that, you know, when it came to um, the slower process that you should be using as a guy vetting a woman when you invite them into your inner circle. If you see any signs of bad behavior from her, I mean, you're going to see it from her kids, I guarantee, but don't listen to me, whatever. If if you see any signs of bad behavior from her, from the kids or anything like that, um, if you're going to allow it to happen, like you're going to get out of life what you tolerate, right? So if you're going to tolerate them abusing you, throwing hissy fits, manufacturing indignation, behaving like little brats, and then of course the mom, you know, because she's mama bear, she's going to side with little kiddos. She's going to side with them and you're going to be the disruptive part of the equation. Well, I should have I should have known in the first instance, and I think the first instance was when I was on that trip, and one of them threw a big ass hissy fit, uh, started yelling. Mom sided with him. I'm not going to get in all the details because it's not particularly relevant, but you know, mom started yelling. Blah blah blah. One thing le led to another, and it was a freaking nightmare for like the rest of the trip. But what did I do? I should have gotten rid of her at that point. I should have gotten rid of her, told her to pound sand and hit the road, move on. Right. I didn't. Oops. What did I do? I stuck around for another almost, uh, two and a half years. So it's incredibly important as a guy, as you navigate, I mean, I wish I had known this lesson in my twenties rather than learning it. At, I don't know. I was like 39 at the time when I was dating this chick. Um, I wish I'd learned this lesson in my 20s, honestly. Uh, like, you're going to get out of life what you tolerate. I had a conversation with um, Greg from AboaAmerican.com uh, on my channel last Thursday or Friday, I think. 
And it wasn't very well received. I'll be honest. You know, I was looking at the like to dislike ratio the other day, and some people didn't like it because of his lifestyle choices and the way that he runs. He's, he's been married 12 times. He's got two wives right now, but he very, very quickly removes women from his life. I mean, he's Muslim, so he does it in a different way than what, than what I'm used to and what many of you guys are probably used to as well. But he gets rid of them very, very quickly. Um, you know, it's, it's almost like they're a disposable commodity. So there's a part of me that, that actually admires other guys that are starting to tune into this ability to hire slowly, basically vet slowly, and then fire quickly. As soon as you see uh, behavior, any signs or signals, more specifically to behavior, not what's said, but what is done. You know, I've mentioned this a few times. I've, I've, I've highlighted in my book, actually, uh, watch what people do because their behavior will give them away. Before I go on to this uh, biz partner story, I think this is probably the biggest super chat I've ever had on my channel. So, dude, GT Wholesale, $500. Thank you. Um, I don't know. I don't, oh, 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 okay, there it is. Um, I saved his life. Love, love, love you, brother. You saved my life. That would that would explain it. So, my friend, I appreciate the super chat. That's That's, that's very generous of you. Thank you. Uh, another channel member, Steve, uh, congratulations on the book, read, read so far, the backstory gives a solid foundation. Glad you're enjoying it. Don't forget to leave a review on Amazon when you're done, by the way, if you got something out of it. Um, all right, before we go to calls, which I will, let me grab the link and drop it in the chat so we can start filling up the waiting area. Bring questions, guys, okay? Um, copy and... Join and ask a question here. Okay, so there's a link. Control. Okay. Uh, make sure you have a good connection. And if you are on a mobile device, please have like headphones, like something wired with a microphone on it so we don't have any issues with audio. Um, I'll get to these calls in just one second. Okay. So let me get to the biz partner story. So I leave the credit and collections world. They give me a package. You know, they fired me very, very quickly. This, the, the full story is in the uh, chapter in the book. I think it's chapter six. But anyway, uh, they fired me very, very quickly uh, because of fit. You'll see why. Um, but I ended up getting involved with a guy that I took on as a business partner after that. And what ended up happening was, um, how can I put this? So I take my package, I go home, I'm considering other options. So I go work for somebody else. Do I start up my own business? I just bought a new house, like literally th three weeks before they packaged me off. Um, so had a new place, uh, just kind of settled in there. And I started looking at business ideas because I always had this inkling that I didn't want to keep working for somebody and I wanted to go do my own thing. So what did I do? I run into this guy who's like, hey, I got this idea for a business. Let's set up this thing and we'll work together on it. Only... I didn't have a day job anymore, so I threw myself into it. He still had his day job, and he didn't want to quit it. So for almost a year, um, I did arguably you know, most of the work, although he might say something different, but I did most of the work because he had his day job, which he was catering to, and in the evening, we'd often get together and do some work together. We'd, we'd strategize and plan some stuff out, but I started to realize after I spent more and more time with this guy who I thought I knew, but I didn't really know him until I started running a business with him that he had um he had a drug problem and he was a control freak uh so of course push comes to shove there's a problem 10 11 months later and what ends up happening we have a big fight a big blowout and he ends up yelling at me saying um you technically don't exist on this business i never put you on the corporate paperwork i could literally lock the door change the locks and it would make make no difference um this guy was a brutal partner to exit from. Um, I learned a lot of lessons there, which I could probably spend at least an hour talking about. But again, the important factor here is, again, is if you don't take your time hire, hiring slowly and firing quickly when your intuition, when your spidey senses speak to you, like when I realized that he was a total control freak and had a drug problem very early on, I should have said, I'm out, I'm done, forget this. Not, not happening, I'm gonna go do something else. But no, again, like a pleb, I stuck around, like most guys will do, you know, myself included. I stuck around for way too, far longer than I should have. Um, and then it ended up in a big blow up. Um, I'm not going to get into the full details, you know, uh, I'll just leave it at that. You can read more about it in the book because I get into a few more 
uh, items in depth. But again, incredibly important men out there watching this. I know this, I'm, I'm talking to men mostly because it's, it's mostly dudes that watch my channel, but incredibly important for you guys to pay very, very close attention to people and their behavior and take your time vetting them to allow them into your business if you're hiring them, if you're hiring them as a manager, if it's a woman that you're inviting to your life, if it's friends that you're inviting to spend more time with you, look very carefully at the behavior, what they choose to do. And if your spidey senses start tingling, if your intuition starts speaking to you in a whisper, listen to it. Because what ends up happening is later on down the road, it becomes a shout. And usually by the time that intuition goes from a whisper to a shout, it's too late and the costs of the exit increase exponentially. All right. Let's move on to calls. So, uh, okay, so the link's in the chat. All you have to do is click that and join. Rob, I see you in the back there. I'll, I'll grab you first. Um, click that to join. Make sure you got a good connection and something wired with a microphone in it. That'll be the best way to go so we have decent audio. So pulling you in, Robert. What's shaking, brother? Hey, Rich. How's it going? Good. How are Can you? Hear good. Um, I was going to ask about how do you go about maybe um, with family members, if they're a sale, how do you, I guess, that ties in a gracious way um, and I guess keep them at distance, but not cause a calamity in your family. So can you give me a little more, like, can you be a little bit more specific about what the problem is? Yeah, I have a family member that I see regularly at social gatherings. Um at, you know, Thanksgiving, Christmas. Uh, Do you have a wired headset so you can get the audio working? Audio it's, it's clipping. It's really bad. Uh, or do you have feedback from audio coming somewhere else? Yeah. Can you hear me better if I stop the video? Nope. 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 Here, I'm going to pull you out and I'm going to put you back in and see if that fixes it. Any better? Check? One, two, three. Check. Still bad, bro. Guys, uh, listen. When you when you click that link and join. Wired headset, Bluetooth headset, something else. You got to have something that's 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 going to take care of the audio. Otherwise, we're going to run into problems like this. Uh, got another guy in the background here. B, going to pull you in. You ready? Let's do this. What's up, brother? Oh, yeah, that was fast. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, you know, I probably... I, yeah, I can hear you fine. Can you hear All me? right, what's your question, man? Hmm? What's your question? Yeah, I can't hear you. You can't hear me? Do you have headphones? Sorry, I got. Can't hear you. <laughs> okay. Oh, it's Brandon. Okay, yeah. I've, yeah. Not good enough. I've I've you. I've talked to you before. Can you hear me? Okay. No. All right. There you go, guys. Click that link, but join it with some headphones. Um. Let me see what else we got over here. Okay, the waiting area is clear, so I can go as long as I need to tonight to take these calls, guys. You guys said to me last week, I got questions. I'd like to call in. I'd like to do a, a call-in show. There you have it. This is the call-in show. So the link's there. Click it. Join. You got any questions as it relates to the book, anything that's going on uh, within the series itself, it's always good to dive into those. There's Steve. Steve, you're coming in. Hey, what's going on, Rich Hart? How are good you, man? Good. How are you doing? Good. What's shaking, man? And not too much. I guess the audio is working. I'm not like uh, the other guys there. <laughs> you figured it out. You got the headphones. Yeah. Absolutely, man. No, just, uh, you know, congratulations again on the book. You know, just going through the, you know, the chapters, you can see the, um, you know, the extent of the, uh, you know, the the guys who had, you know, come to you who had gotten help. And you're actually, you know, you, you're putting it all in one place for us. And, uh, you know, I couldn't be more appreciative. It was, uh, you know, on Amazon. I'll do a review. Thank and you. uh yeah you know i just uh i like what you're doing for the i guess the manosphere right now so just a uh, real positive stuff man yeah yeah i don't i don't work there i mean i do my own thing there's, <laughs> there's some guy that elected himself the president i got nothing to do with those clowns but uh, uh, anyway you know so, uh, funny? did you have a question for me tonight yeah you know what it's it's actually about that it's uh i hate these labels that guys are using you know whether it's mig tower or, mm -hmm. you know even just you know ltrs or you know any of these type of things like can we not have like a dialogue without having these categories that you have to put guys into. Cause you know, I couldn't really put you into a category, you know, versus, uh, you know, the other gentlemen who, uh, you know, are in the, uh, you know, the, the top tier of the manosphere, but I just think there's, you know, a different way to be doing it. And every guy's got their own, uh, their own style. And 
Um, you know, I just think, uh, you know, most guys gravitate to yours because you're not, uh, you know, you're not pushing all those uh, labels back on people. So what would be like a good way to, you know, define yourself in, you know, 2020 as a man, just, you know, being a good man, you know, basically. Point of origin, man. It, like it all boils down to ignoring the noise, not caring what people think of you. There's a chapter in my book about giving fewer Fs, right? Um, <laughs> I saw that. I saw that. Yeah. It'll make sense to you when you get you know, get to it. And by the way, guys, um, you know, one of the things I wanted to say on the show, which I think is relevant to the topic and part of the chapter is don't wait till you're on your deathbed to tell somebody how you feel. Tell them to fuck off now, right? Like, if, <laughs> like if they're imposing on your time in your life, tell them to get lost. Tell them to pound sand as soon as you recognize that they're a anchor in your life. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, like back to your point, Steve, not the point of origin. Just, just ignore the noise, the labels, the, this pill, that pill, that, that sphere, this sphere. <laughs> I don't, I don't associate with any of that nonsense. You know, my channel has always been entrepreneurs and cars. I was just a guy that wanted to talk to my friends and their success rides and kind of break out those stories. And I just kind of started leaning into some other stuff that were wounds that I had that I needed to work on and learn about other things. And people started asking me questions. So it just kind of schooled in all that. Things yeah. like LTR, yeah. not a big deal, yeah. right? Let's just call it a long-term relationship LTR. It's rather, it's, it's just easier than saying the whole thing, but. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or, or even, you know, like I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm a fan of Rolo as well, but you know, he, using frame and that type of, uh, you know, that language is just, it just sort of limits you a little bit. And, and I gotta say, you know, you always preach it. I go back and I watch your old videos, you know, you got a little, little bit of hair left there. The beard's a little shorter and it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's you in your car talking about doing all, all these things. And, you know, the fact that those videos are available for free, guys can go back and watch them. They can see, you know, if they want to know how they, how, you know, how to become, you know, a successful entrepreneur, you know, go back and watch the videos. There's a, uh, there's a playbook that you're like, you're laying out there for people. If they just, you know, take the time to, uh, you know, to invest a little bit and, you know, to see, you know, where we've all stumbled and, you know, you know how I have. And, you know, I think by sharing those stories, you just, uh, it allows people to come into your life because they're a little bit less threatened. Right. So hundred percent. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate that. So go watch the older videos on the channel. Thanks, Steve. I recommend it, man. Absolutely. Thanks, Rich. All right. I'm going to pull in some of these other guys. Uh, I'm going to remove you. Thanks for hopping on, man. Peace. Thanks. All right. Um, I'm going to grab Santiago next, uh, then Spencer, and then you, Muhammad. Okay. So just give me a second. Let me grab Santiago. Oh, hang on. Let me get the super chat first. Uh, what's ARS? I don't know what that currency is, but thank you for the ARS. Uh, he says, good night. I'm building muscles and learning game. I'm a programmer in Argentina. There you go. 30 years old, earning $7,800 a year. How can I learn to make six figures, books, courses that you recommend? Um, you're a programmer. If you can find a way to sell a skill that you have online in a course, uh, you can make a hell of a lot, a hell of a lot more than $7,800 a year. I'm guessing that's USD, but yeah, you can make a hell of a lot more um, building something that's online because the world's a lot bigger than Argentina. One of the first mistakes that I made in my business was um, I focused just on Canada when I was doing my uh, debt relief. And um, Canada's a tiny market. It's, you know, there's like, I don't know what the population is now. I think it's like something like 38 million, but we've got a lot of immigration. When I first started, we were like 32 or 33 million. I was looking at the demographics and I was looking at the stats on debt and it's like, Man, the world's a big place. There's 8 billion people, and I'm only focusing on just over 30 million. Um, I mean, the cool thing about YouTube is you can, I mean, we can all upload to the same upload button. I hit the same button that Casey Neistat does, that PewDiePie does, you know, like all the giant ass channels out there. So we all have the opportunity to reach more people and spread the message and talk further. So um yeah thank you but definitely put something online because the world's a far far bigger place in argentina and you've got a far greater opportunity books courses create your own create your own course is what i would say but you need an audience you need to have the attention of people to sell it to if that's what you're going to build and the problems that you're going to solve i actually have a guy in argentina that i uh coached a couple years ago he's a british expat married an argentinian he's down there and he does uh, jazz duets, if I recall, uh, and he sells them online. And he makes a very good living. Uh, he's got a nice YouTube channel. He's got a nice audience that he talks to. Um, and he just teaches people how to play jazz music. Um, it, it, it grew super fast. So, I mean, the world's your oyster. 
you know, stop, stop looking at these tight little boundaries around cities that you live in, or maybe even country boundaries. The world's big. Okay. So go like, think bigger. I mean, you're thinking anyway, so think bigger, if that makes sense. Uh, let me remove that. Um, let me hit GT wholesale. So, uh, just click the link in the chat where it says, join and ask a question and in your name, put GT wholesale, just so I know that it's you. And I'll make sure that I put you at the front of the line. Um, you know, it's the best that I can do to, uh, Get you some assistance with whatever you need to ask. All right, Santiago, let's do this. What's up, brother? Hey, Rich. Look at that Doing studio, good. How are man. You? <laughs> it's getting it's getting bigger. What are you doing these <laughs> days? Uh, well, I've been doing a lot of things, and that's why I call the show. So, from when I first started, uh, well, I got divorced, and you know, it, people can go back and and see. I remember that you and Rollo used to say, if you have options, that's the key on everything, right? Yeah. So I diversified my income. So I have now, I work, I have a, a, a podcast and I also do some things online. So that's why I have the studio. And I also work as a veterinarian, the equine veterinarian. And mm -hmm. I also have a private, uh, so I work also, I have a corporate job and I also have a small a business that I'm growing up on 3D printing. Got so. It. So the, the best thing, as you were saying, is having options. Oh, that's also goes to the people that you work with. Mm -hmm. So if if you have a lot of people that you've been selecting and growing, things will go well. But if they, if things are not working, even if you try to make them work, they won't work. So it's just like relationships, like you were saying. Yeah, so if like someone is not working, is no exactly. If things are not working, you need to let them go. And sometimes. Uh, HR is very difficult and that will it will be a hassle, but it's better to chop your hand when it's infected than having it rot the whole the whole body, right? So it's better to just uh, if you apply the same principles that we apply in the RP to your job, everything mm -hmm. will go well. Like that's something that I, I've I, I've been applying to all the enterprises that I've been going on through the past couple of years. And things have been going well. Like if you if you think without sentiment, just with your head and no feelings, and you just think and, and you don't take into account if the other person is like, no, I really need this job, you can help them out finding a better fit, a better fitting job for them mm -hmm. later on if they really want to get close, than to keep them in your uh, next to you and just being a drag. So you you want sales, like you used to say. You want people that will push you to be better and that challenge you. You don't want people that just start hanging out with you and not really adding anything to you. So Absolutely, I appreciate yeah. everything that you've been giving. And, what's your, uh, um, what's your uh, podcast on? Uh, it's, it's not, has nothing to do with what I, what my main job that I'm a veterinarian. So I mm -hmm. actually find, found a, a little niche that it's on comic conventions and things that are a little nerdy and okay. are, are like my, I, I kind of blow steam doing that. So that's like my hobby, Good. although it's starting to, to make some income. So that like everything you do has to give you something back. Right. So I yeah, started like, that. I think I've talked to you so, about three times in the last couple of years. And, and every time I see you, you look better, you look fitter and your background keeps oh, changing. It keeps improving. <laughs> oh yeah, it does. The first time I called, it was just a bench and the computer and a yeah. camera. And now it's, it's a little bigger. Yeah, for those of you that don't know the original story, um, I mean, Santiago wrote an email to me and Rolo, um, I don't know, about a year or two ago, and he told the story about how he was basically yes. on the edge, and he's a veterinarian, so he had horse tranquilizer, and he's about to off himself because he had such a bad divorce experience, but he's clearly turned himself around, you know, he's a guy that's done the work, so, you know, I'm always pleased to see you when you hop on, man. Yeah, the, w the way I say it to my friends is like when you're playing a video game or you're doing anything and you finish that task and then you go out and have to do the uh, extra achievements. That's how mm. I feel now in my life. Yeah. The most difficult thing I had to do was uh, my divorce. And when I, was, when I was about to off myself and thanks to you and Rollo, um, the videos that came off, uh, that was kind of ending the game. And now I'm just finding all the other achievements, all the joys in life, having fun enjoying everything. And, um, I thank you for that, that like, like life is really good right now. Did, did you, um, I know that the book's not available on print in Mexico. Did you get a, a Kindle copy? I did get a Kindle copy and I'm waiting for the hard copy. I saw that you have a, the ISBN number in the, in the Kindle. So as soon as it's available, I'll get one. 
Cool. Hey, do me a favor. Send me an email with your mailing address. I'm going to ship you a physical copy of the book. I'm going to write a little something on the inside leaf for you just as a gift. Okay. Oh, sure. Sure. I'll send you an email for right. sure. Thank you very much. Cool. I'll talk to you Thank later. Talk to you later. All right, man. Peace. Um, Spencer, let me grab you because I think you are next. Uh, let me grab the super chat real quick here. Kevin Leith. Oh, that's not it. Kevin Leith. There you are. Welcome to the channel as a member. Appreciate that support. Uh, let me grab the super chat first. Spencer Kurt says, Hey, Rich, love your content. With your help, I've learned the importance of self reliance, the refusal of depending on excuses. But what's your opinion on dogs? Is getting a dog for company a beta move? Dude, I love dogs. Um, I actually love other people's dogs because I don't want to deal with the vet bills and the fact that they live a lot shorter than we do um, and the hair. <laughs> um, I'm a big dog guy, though. I had a Rottweiler, you know, when I was in my 20s. And um, I think the Belgian Mal Malinois, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, is probably one of my favorites right now. Um, I may actually be getting a dog, um, you know, pretty soon. So um, I don't. I don't think it's a beta move. I think dogs are great companions and they're loyal as hell. A lot of guys are like, you know, I want a companion, this and that and the other thing. Get a dog if you want to. If you want a loyal companion, get a dog. Trust me. Uh, Spencer, let's do this. What's up, brother? Hey, man, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Awesome. Yeah, to, uh, to, that, to that super chat, uh, getting a dog is definitely not beta. Definitely not, in my opinion. No, dogs are boss, man. Yeah, Way for sure. better than cats. Oh, thousand times better. Hey, so uh, two quick questions uh, here. So the first question about like hiring slow and firing fast regarding like women. So when you're vetting women, you're dating them, all that. Um, I've experienced this a couple of times and I'm curious if you have too, where people tell you, oh, Rich or Spencer, I think your, your expectations, your standards are too high and you're being too hard on other people and you're demanding, t you know, too much. Because who's saying that to, to you? Is that your family or, or friends? A, a, a friend in this specific situation I'm thinking of, like a, a close uh, co-worker and friend. Okay. Um, and um, I'm, I'm pretty hard on myself. I, I'm, you know, physically and like my, my work habits and everything, I, I set pretty high goals and expectations. So I invariably apply that to people that I'm, that are surrounded by my, sur surrounded by me. Right. Cause you want to have good, positive, healthy people around you. And, um, it's, you know, as we've discussed on the show and people have said, it's, it's hard to surround yourself with positive people that are a good influence. It can be, you know, depending on where you're at in, you know, in the world or in the country, in your workplace, it can be difficult. So especially when it comes to women, if you're trying to let them into your life um, closely, um, I'll just see if you, you know, you're going to get that right. I mean, like if you set strict, strict boundaries about who you're going to allow in your inner circle, whether it's employees, whether it's women, whether it's friends, especially with women. And if you're getting, you know, if you're getting older in your family or, or friends have certain expectations of you, you know, societal expectations, oh, you got to find one and settle down and have kids, and, you know, be miserable like everybody else sort of thing. And you're like, well, I got rid of her because she was crazy or I got rid of her because she, she was a feminazi or I got rid of her because I don't like, uh, you know, women that don't put a priority on self care and they're getting fat or whatever. Right. Like right. these are like, it's your life. Right. And the thing that you got to get your head around as a dude, as you're navigating again, your life is, are you making yourself your own mental point of origin with every choice, with every day, with every week, with every month and year, are you, are you continuing to making to, to, to making choices that align with things that serve you? And it's very, very different when guys start to unplug from the bull crap and start to make themselves their own mental point of origin because people will criticize you. You will lose friends. They're going to start to challenge you. You know, why are you being so picky, Spencer? You know, what's wrong with Jill? You know, Jill was a good girl. Why didn't you pick Jill? Like, you know, what the hell was wrong with her? Well, she had two kids in tow from two different fathers. That's what's wrong with her. Okay. So stop bothering me. Piss off. Right. Um, you just have to be firm with them, right? Like you have to hold firm, strong boundaries. And if you set high standards for yourself, you're going to do far better in the world, but at the same time, you're also going to tolerate less crap and you're going to have more criticism, um, you know, of your choices because of those higher standards, right? People, people generally speaking, have very low standards, you know, for themselves and for the world. I mean, look at the world right now. We're in a lockdown state for something that you can only see it under a microscope that only like 99 point some like 8% of uh, people survive if they get it. 
but we're in complete lockdown because everybody wants to be a pussy, right? So we don't have very, very high standards for ourselves and society. You know, we want to weaken society and lower it. It's like, you know, in a uh, school gym where the basketball net was too high and the kids couldn't, you know, dunk it, they would just lower the basketball net. That's what we're doing right now. And when you hold yourself to higher standards in, in life, you've got to understand that, that, that people will point and sputter at you. Right. Yeah, for sure. Um, so kind of a second question, do you have any thoughts or maybe, you know, how I could apply this to, or how uh, the viewers can apply this, say you're an employee. So say you're not a supervisor yet. Say you're just a, you know, professional in a corporate environment, so on. I mean, you're not gonna be doing any firing obviously, but mm -hmm. is, there, is this mindset applicable somehow? Cause obviously in the corporate world, especially if you're not a supervisor, you do have to play the game. Right, yeah. Listen, if you if you run the business or you have free ran free reign from your employer, you can do whatever you want. You know, you can mm -hmm. fire people when you want. But the problem is, is that if you're a supervisor manager working for a large corporation, they make you jump through all kinds of like I remember when I was working in the credit and collection world, I think we had something like 600 seats in the office and most of them were filled most of the time. Um, I would routinely like people would routinely shuffle around staff that were problem and rather than firing them, right? What do they do? They just move them out of their department. So every couple months I got some loser that was utterly useless that I would try to train, that I would find that I was wasting my time on and that I would want to fire. And interestingly, lower level employees are quite a bit harder to fire than like managers, like at the manager level that that I was at because it was president VP uh, and then it was the department manager. So I was one of the department managers in a, in a office that had 600 people. Um, it was a lot easier to fire a guy like me because of fit. Cause when head office, you know, comes down and says, okay, we need to cut a uh, manager salary off the uh, budget. You know, they just kind of look around and go, well, who are we button heads with? And it's like this guy over here, who's the office defenestrator. He's the guy that gets, you know, the can. So, they actually move managers out at least once a year in most large businesses like that, especially where they have to cut back. But lower level employees, you're going to have a harder time moving them out unless you've got free reign from your boss or you run your own business. I used to fire people quickly in my own business, man. Like I remember um, there was this one guy that was screwing the pooch and he was a sales guy. And um, I caught him. What was that website? I think it was called Hot or Not or some, some not nonsense like that. He would spend his entire afternoon... I'm paying the dude to do a job. He spent his entire afternoon surfing the internet on this hot or not on like gay and transvestite stuff. And I'm well, like, you're not doing your job. I don't care what you're doing. You're completely distracted. You're getting out of here pissed off, right? <laughs> you know, you got to cut the guy a uh, check because, you know, there's severance pay and all this sort of stuff. But, you know, when you start to see that somebody is an utter and complete train wreck, like they're an anchor in your business and your life and your friend circle. If, if, you know, if it's a woman, get rid of them and don't look back. Mm -hmm. Trust me. Yeah, for sure. For sure. All right, man. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, for sure. For sure. Appreciate it. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. We'll see you soon. You. Okay. Um, let me, I'm going to move you to the front of the line GT because of that huge super chat. So there you go, brother. How you doing? How do you tell somebody you're meeting Canadian Jesus? And I know that may sound ridiculous to you, but when I was kicked out of my home, the cops put a shotgun to my head. My wife told them I was violent. It cost me $1.5 million to get rid of that problem. And I haven't seen my sons in three years. And I'm going, what happened to me? Yeah. I saw you, Corey Wayne. And I know you guys, all of you men, tend to, tend to poop on each other, for lack of a better term. You mm. all moved the ball. Mystery moved the ball. Neil Strauss moved the ball. Mm. You moved the ball. Rolo moved the ball. If you move the ball, don't fight each other. You helped every one of those people help me in some small way. You and Corey Wayne more than others. Okay. Please. My friend, I can't thank you enough. And I'm, I'm, I'm honored and privileged. I do very well. I sell football helmets for a living. So if, you know, anybody listening, if you buy a football helmet in the United States, I send it to you. If you go to 1-800-NFL-SHOP, I send it to you. I'm very successful. When my wife decided she was done with me, she took our house. She took my my boys. Hey, Richard, it hurts, brother. Yeah. It hurts, brother. And I listen to your story and others, other stories. 
but I'm so happy now. I'm so happy now because you guys show me the way. You know what, Rich? You Men feel like they're alone, and we can't ask people. Here, here's the biggest difference between men and women I've noticed is they tell women, do what's right for you, girl. They tell men, you do what's right. You know, you got to be a stand-up guy. And Rick, men have always been the disposable sex. You women know what are my always the protective sex, you, right? My problem with you and other people is me. How can nine, you tell me, Rich, how can I go, Rich is right, Rich is right, Rich is right. Rich is wrong. Oh, Rich must be wrong on this one. And I do this with Rollo and Corey Wayne and the others. Alpha mm -hmm. male strategies. You're right on 55 things. But as a man, I don't agree with one. I'm like, oh, this must be wrong. <laughs> this must be wrong. Yeah. Why do I believe 55 things, Rich, in the 60th or the hey, Rich, it's mind boggling. We're men. I got two, I got two friends suffering. Rich. They need, they need the restraining order. You know why they won't go, Rich? Pride. Pride. And I said, don't go. Don't believe me. You will have the restraining order. It will be on you. Mm -hmm. But, Rich, as men, we don't listen to other men until, hey, Rich, how do I put this? No one believes you're going to trip until you trip, if that makes sense. How do you make, Rich, tell me, please, God. You, you know so many people in this field. How do I make other men believe you're walking into a minefield? You're going to get your leg blown off. You know, the problem is, though, and I deal with this in the first chapter of my book, is we've been brainwashed as men, one in ten, yeah. We've been, we've been brainwashed as men our entire lives. Like, you look at everything from the function of school, the way that we were treated when we were disciplined in school, the fact that they – teach boys um, or teach and treat boys like they're defective girls. Like when I was in grade seven, um, I was constantly in the principal's office. I had my desk in the vice principal's office for one week because the teacher didn't know what to do with me in a classroom. But the fact remains, I was bored as hell, right? Like I wasn't learning anything. I felt like uh, things were moving too slow. They brought in the Ministry of Education. They start testing me because they thought I was retarded. They're like, oh, let's go through an IQ test. I blow through the test. I've got a wicked high IQ. So the problem is, is that the that society itself does it. Like, I feel bad for boys today. Like, in one sense, I wish I had sons. But in the other sense, I'm very glad that I don't because society treats males horribly. You know, you're a disposable commodity. Um, you know, you look at sitcoms. Every single sitcom that I watched when I was growing up, Home Improvement, The Cosby Show. 1.5 million. It doesn't matter what the show was. The man was always portrayed like a bumbling idiot. You know, the woman was always coordinated, classy, uh, you know, had the respect of everybody. And the father was a bumbling idiot with a man cave underneath the stairs. Right. It's, you know, I could go on and on for an hour and like break down everything that's happened. But this is why men have gotten to where they are today. And this is also why I wrote the book is I wanted to distill everything that I've come across over the last, you know, four or five years, put it in something that's like 200 words. You can read it in one day. It's dense, clean cut. It's cold and hard. I mean, I know there's going to be people that are going to read it and they'll be like, oh, this is, you know, I wanted rainbows and butterflies. I want you to send me, you know, pe people want you to sell them comforting lies. Okay. It's very, very hard to sell the cold, hard truth. It's so hard. So hard. Rich, I didn't buy this shirt for me. My new girlfriend bought it for me. Beautiful. <laughs> Hey, Rich, that's the biggest problem. We are men. We think we know everything or we learned everything. Rich, I do it on a daily basis. You or the others will say, and Rich, this is, this is a three-year trek for me. Three-year trek. How can I believe 97% of what you say, but when something disagrees, whatever that thing is in my head, I go, well, Rich is obviously wrong on this one. Some of my some of my biggest haters used to be my biggest fans. It's you know it's just the nature of you touch them, the Rich. Don't give up hurt. on them. Hmm? Don't give up on them, Rich. You touch them. If they disagree with you, I'm one of them, Rich. If they disagree <laughs> with you, you've touched them. I know this. You I saved them. Already. They just I don't know, know you, Rich. Rich, please, 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 my hand to God. You touch them. Whoever disagrees with you, my friend, please reach out to them more.
make them hate you. <laughs> well, if you brother, don't have haters, you're not doing something brother, right. I know that for sure. Come. I'm on the Bay in Ventnor, New Jersey. You're welcome at my home. And I told this to you. I told this to Donovan Sharp. I told this to many, many, many of you people. You're always welcome in Ventnor, New Jersey. I have a home for you. I have a bed for you. I have something for you to eat. And uh, maybe I have a young lady that wants to meet you, but we'll, we'll, we'll take that. <laughs> no. My friend, please, please. All right, brother. Do the work. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you, man. Thank you. Love Thank you, you for sharing love your you. story. And thanks again for the super you. chat. All right. Love you, brother. Peace. All right. Um, I had Muhammad queued up next. So I'll bring you in. Just give me a second. There's a couple of super chats that piled in while we were chatting. Give me a second here. Uh, did the dog one and Fernando. Uh, thank you. I am working on in programming courses. Would you also recommend investing in stocks or other things in the side saving minimalism? Um, this is the Argentinian. Uh, yes, yes, and yes. Um, all of those things, but you don't have a large enough income to really start diversifying. I would, I would work on building your annual income dramatically by going more global and, and selling something um, that you can offer on the global marketplace. But you do need an audience to sell it to. Like you have to have the attention of people. And then once you have access to financial resources, then you start to look at things like stocks, private equity investing, cryptocurrency. I mean, you can buy $5 worth of crypto today, right? Like you can buy $5 worth of Bitcoin today, keep it on your ledger wallet or on your Coinbase or whatever. But yes, definitely start to diversify once you've got something working and paying you money. And there's also a super chat from Classified Chappie. Thank you for that. Um, all right, Muhammad, you're up. All right. Hey, Rich, can you hear me? Loud and clear, bro. All right. So here's a quick question for you. Um, I came across uh, your channel, a little bit of backstory. I came across your channel after dying of my success course during break and come to the realization that I will never use this course in my life. As Sorry, you whoa, whoa. Described, Back up for a sec. Dying from what? Uh, I wasn't dying. I was, I hated my life when I was taking a statistics course okay. and knowing that every second of it, I was never going to use any part of it in my life. Bro, did you ever hear my you. statistics story? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it uh, made me laugh quite a bit. Dude, um, what a waste of time that was. I know. Well, I was already halfway through my schooling. So uh, my graduate, my bachelor, so I, I didn't think, uh, think it would be wise to stop. Um, I finished my degree uh, spring of last year. I didn't find a job in my field of study. Now I was involved in construction and uh, I was making okay money, but nothing serious. Uh, fast forward toward the end of the year, I got my builder's license, formed my own company. And uh, I was involved in construction for two years prior to graduating or a year or so. And I always had my own work on the side going. Um, so I'd work part time and have my own thing going. Uh, COVID happens, lockdown uh, takes place. I'm in Michigan. Uh, we get laid off for like six weeks in the spring. I get back, uh, get back on board, work until August 1st, and I get laid off again. Um, mm -hmm. I was self-employed that entire time. And in that time, I made as much money being a solo contractor as I would have had I been employed with the company I was with for a full year. So I just finished all the big jobs I had. And my question for you is, should I look back at white collar work again? Um, reason I ask is construction is really hard on the body. Uh, lots and lots of time spent. Like you, it's not anything you can, it's direct labor, right? So if you quote a job, I was finishing basements. I can't not be there or hire someone else and expect things to be done, you know, completely. Mm -hmm. So I'm at a crossroad now is should I look into white collar work and just at least give it a shot for supply chain management? That's what I studied. Or do you think I should just stick with construction and just keep going with it? The problem with labor and I mean, I've done both, right? Um, yeah. I used to love working on cars. I took a co-op course in school and I, I breathed in, a, you know, my fair amount of asbestos doing drum breaks and shit like that. But, um, I mean, the thing with labor is as you get older, I mean, like if you ever meet somebody that's been working with their hands, you know, their entire life and they're it's like, very in their taxing 60s, on the body. their hands are like baseball gloves right? Yeah. It's like hard leather, like mm -hmm. calloused all over and, and shit. 
and they've got aches and pains all over their body. And I started, I already have that started. Yeah, right. Back and, so, and hips and whatnot. I mean, I did a lot of manual outside stuff in my teen years and even in my twenties and I, and I still lift weights. Right. So mm -hmm. I mean, like I still tax my body to some degree. It's just when you lift weights, I mean, you know, you can decide when you're going to do it and what the movements are and how much resistance that you want to use. So it's a little bit more controlled, but yeah, yeah your body's going to break down sooner. So it's, my personal choice that I'd rather do something where I'm not expending like 5,000 calories a day, breaking mm -hmm. my back, doing something. Um, that's, that's just what I would be doing. So, so the, uh, yeah. Entrepreneurship versus try giving white collar a shot and, you know, take it from entrepreneurship there. Entrepreneurship all day long, but it's not for everybody. Like, yeah. like not everybody yeah. can, not everybody has the gumption to start and run a business. Like you got to remember, oh, absolutely. Like, um, Absolutely. nine out of 10 fail. And an, another stat that I came across once is something like 98.7% of businesses like entrepreneurs mm -hmm. never crack more than a million dollars a year in annual sales. Yeah. So the landscape maintenance guys, the snow plowing guys, yeah. the dry cleaners, the corner store guys, mm -hmm. like almost like 99% of businesses out there never crack a million dollars a year in sales. So things like the apples of the world, the Amazons of the world, even like my debt business, reach, which was doing like, like 3.8 million at one point, yeah. it's, 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 it's very, very hard. So, I mean, um, it's not easy to do, but if you can do it, I'll, you know, I'll tell you this, it's one of the most gratifying things I've ever done my entire life. Mm -hmm. It's, it's incredible to be able to build something where you can hire people, you manage that, amount of cash. I mean, we were doing almost $290,000 a month in sales at one point. Um, and everything that you learn along the way, dealing with legal matters, accountants, uh, human resource, government issues, uh, human, like <laughs> everything that comes up along the way, it's stuff that you don't even fathom thinking. Like when I was sitting in my statistics class in college and I was sitting there going, this is bullshit. Like who cares what the statistic probability of, yeah. of, of an auditorium is with yeah. hundred people that there's going to be, uh, a visible minority that's transgender and five foot four, like who, who <laughs> like, when am I ever going to use this in my life? Yeah, but this is the never. stuff that they teach kids going through school now. Right. Yep. Anyway, that's just my take on it. All right. Make sense. Yep. Thanks so much. All right, bro. Take care. Uh, I'm going to pull you in Samuel next. Just let me hit these super chats real quick. Got an Uber driver here from Baltimore, made hundred K driving this year. That's good, man. After an eight year relationship up with a girl and her family who said, I work too much. Just bought your book. Thanks, Rich. Appreciate it. Thank you, man. Um, by the way, I'll share this real quick story. The most successful Uber driver that I ever read about was a guy that was a jewelry designer and he worked in the high end regions of, um, LA, like Beverly Hills. Um, he used to sell like, you know, you have the attention of somebody for 20, 30 minutes in the car. He used to sell high end jewelry to them while he was driving Uber in that area. Um, so just think of a way, you know, that you can capitalize on the attention of people. If you have that opportunity, just, you know, you can look up that story. I think it was in Forbes somewhere. Um, classified chappy. Welcome to the channel. You become a member and there's a super chat from classified, uh, meant to put, thank you for giving us the steps to follow to the best version. Currently 22 and I'm learning more of the steps. Remember. Awesome. Uh, Samuel, you're up, bro. Add to stream. There you go. All right. Uh, been a follower of your channel for a while. Just bought your book. Thank you. Um, okay. So I've got, uh, one question business and one question, uh, women related. First one is as someone who's been in the online business and, you know, you've grown your YouTube channel, you know, what would be the first things for someone who wants to start and get into business and grow either a following YouTube channel or a podcast? What would be the first things that you would do to save time that you know now you didn't do before, but you're like, if I had set these things up, it would have saved you time. Well, that's, that's an interesting question because for the first, like here, because I mean, for the first while, when you're, when you're broadcasting, whether that's a podcast or that's a, um, let me see if I can pull this up on the screen while I'm talking here and kind of do two things at once. But whenever you press play, whenever you press upload, it doesn't matter what that looks like. You're doing it to crickets. <laughs> Nobody's <laughs> listening. Right. <laughs> you know, maybe you share it on like Facebook and Twitter. Um, there we go. So 
I'm going to, let me just. Also, for the most part of my life, I'm so new to social, not new to social media, but I've just hardly ever on it. So, so like, that's a good thing for me because I can just use it for business purposes, but otherwise, yeah. Let me just, let me just illustrate what a channel looks like to the content creator. So for May, so for two years, nothing happened. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Okay. Um, we're at, we're at 2020 now. So basically for a third of the time that I've been doing YouTube, I was talking to nobody. It was crickets, nothing. You know, there's like 275 views, 37 views early on, like 25 views. Like you're talking to nobody. You're just talking to yourself. But the key thing here to remember is you just have to keep doing it. And if you love what you're doing and you love having the conversations, you'll do it anyway. And one of the things that I found helpful to me that also transitioned from the car stuff to more of the... Um, you know, work on yourself, the red pill sort of content was I had wounds in myself that I needed to work on. And I would tell stories about that as I was kind of going about my day, whether it was at the, like the office here or driving in my car or whatever, you just have to have that, that, that strong passion for it. Otherwise it's never going to show. It's never going to like take off. Like I got 900 videos on my channel. I guarantee there's like close to 500 people watching. It. I guarantee not everybody has seen even 10% of those videos, I guarantee it, right? So you just have to remember that when you're creating content, when you're broadcasting, whether it's a blog, whether it's videos, whether it's a podcast, you're not gonna have anybody's attention for a long time. It might be two years, it might be two months, I don't know, but um, it really depends on what you're talking about, what niche it's in, um, whether you get like a, a break, like somebody with a big account sees something that you do, you know, that you do and then they share it. Um, you know, there's all kinds of opportunities for that to happen. Mine was mostly, mostly organic. I never really had any collabs or interviews with anybody anyway. for a long time. Yeah. I prefer organic anyway. I've already started more or less a kind of, as far as entrepreneurship goes, freelancing, as far as a online marketer, I do copywriting mm -hmm. and I do get clients that way. But, um, I guess a follow-up question to that would be, do you generally think someone can be successful in entrepreneurship if they don't have some sort of uh, significant amount of pain in their life that they're trying to overcome? Well, you, I mean, let me put it this way. The biggest challenge that an entrepreneur is going to face in his business is his ability to solve problems. The, the grit, the relentless grit that you need because that's what you're doing. You're solving problems. It's like, I have, I have nobody's money right now. I have a service, a product, a whatever, a, a course, a book, a, a podcast, a, a video, whatever it is. I have this and I want people's money in exchange for it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's all kinds of problems that come with that. Like how do you solve marketing? How do you solve, you know, your first transaction, billing, refunds, customer service, HR, if you got to hire people, contractors, if you got to manage them, there's all kinds of things that come up. The most important skill that an entrepreneur must must possess is the ability to solve problems. Hmm. Yeah, just to add value. Well, no, the value should be there. Like it should be a given. Like you should be adding value, bottom line, you know, starting point. Like it, like it has to be there if you're selling something. But you have to have the ability to solve problems. You have to have the like the grit and the fortitude to go and find the answers because. The answers are out there. Like most people are, are like, oh, well, I got to go invent this and I got to code that and I got to do this and learn how to do this skill. Like I know people that'll go take an accounting course, a legal course, a marketing course, a sales course. And it's like, no, when you're an entrepreneur, you hire a lawyer. When you're an entrepreneur, you hire an accountant. When you're an entrepreneur, you hire a salesperson, right? You have to have the basic skills, like the, like the basic know-how, but the answers to everything when it comes to business already exist out there. All you have to do is look around, do some R&D, which doesn't stand for research and development. It stands for rip off and duplicate and go, oh, they have a good idea. Let me take that, unplug it and put it in my business. Gotcha. I've actually never heard it that way. So that's something very important to keep in mind. Well, it's see, it's the it's the innovation that see entrepreneurship is all about innovation it's all about innovating solving problems and looking for solutions that aren't currently in your toolbox and often you just steal them from other people you know you just steal like these ideas 
concepts, business practices from other companies. Like when I first started up and I hired my business coach and I did an interview with Cameron, his name's Cameron Harold. So you should go back, back to the playing the win series. And I had him on about a month ago. Um, I wanted to figure out office culture. Like I wanted to have a cool office culture. So I was talking to him about it. What should I do? Cause I knew that he had the skills. He started sending me and setting up, um, introductions to different offices in the Toronto area. And I drove to, I don't know, at least half dozen, maybe 10 of them. And I met with the CEOs. I spent the day with them. They toured me the office. They gave me like the full inside, you know, tour, like all the information, right? So you have to have some good people around too. Mm. And that's my biggest problem that I have right now. Well, you're I'm, young. Like how old are you? 21. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, if you were to send me a message and be like, Hey, Rich, I want to pick your brain. All that I see immediately when I see that is you want to steal my time. Like you want my time for right. free and that's, to get yeah. right. So I'd rather what you have to do as a young guy is you, is you have to go and find companies that you want to work with or people that you want to work with and then offer solutions to them to serve them. Right. Like, let me do your copywriting for six months. Right. Like I love your product. I love your service. I'm a really good copywriter. I'm going to, I'm going to write your email copy for the next six months or three months or whatever you think is reasonable. Right. And then you kind of go and serve them. And, and as you're doing that, maybe in an internship or mentorship, you know, you can start to learn things from them in their own business too. Right. Yeah. Mentorship is, I think the most important thing that I've figured. So just really quickly, so I don't take up too much more time. Uh, do you have time for the second question or do you want to move Real on? Real quick, yeah. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to women, I've as far as games concerned, uh, one thing I've really kind of come into a problem is understanding the balance between if you were to approach some a girl or a woman and uh, you're showing intent and attraction, but how do you approach them without coming off as needy? Like since you're supposed to, but the thing is I find the most success when I just don't care. Here's, here's what I would recommend you do. Um, as you're going about your day, you go to the bank, you get your coffee, you put gas in your car, you see a cute, a cute girl, just mm -hmm. chat her up. That's what even, I usually do. Yeah. Even if you don't ask her out or ask for a number or say, hey, I've enjoyed talking to you, but I got to run. I'm super busy. I'd love to continue this conversation. What's your number? Right. Mm -hmm. just, just, just chat them up and start getting comfortable with giving zero Fs about how they, how they respond to you. You're going to start to notice after a while that women will give indicators of int interest, small ones. Like you have to be able to, you know, pick up on the body language, how they're talking to you when they start asking you questions and stuff like that. But you just can't care about it, right? Like, like when you see Myron Gaines talk about the amount of approaches that he makes, like he'll make 40 approaches and close one or two, right? Right. But I'm sure he's he's walking around Miami just talking to every haughty thoughty that he like comes across. So um you know it's a numbers game but i don't like the idea of like cold approaching like oh you know i got to get my uh quota of uh you know 40 girls today i'd rather focus on chasing excellence and as i'm going about my day if there's a you know if there's some attractive women that are around i'm at the bank i'm getting gas i'm at the coffee shop just chat them up right and that way you don't worry about the approach anxiety you don't really care whether they say yes or no You'll probably end up closing some. You're going to get shot down by a lot too. You're going to get the, I have a boyfriend, I'm busy, no, piss off, weirdo, whatever, right? Who, who, who cares? You know, maybe you see them again. You probably aren't going to anyway. Where do you live? Do you live in a big city? I live uh, actually pretty close to Miami. I'm on the opposite side of the Gulf side uh, in the Naples town. Oh, that's a nice area. So yeah, yeah okay. Well, it's not a huge town, but I mean, like still just, just, just kind of do it as you go about your day, man. Yeah. It's actually great for networking as well, since a lot of people are <laughs> old and successful. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, well, All anyway, right. thank you so much, Rich. You're great welcome. time talking to you. Good meeting you. See you, man. Um, let's do, what is it, nine? Okay, I got to hop off the stream probably in the next 15, 20 to do my private stream for my community. So let's grab Mike and AEO. Mike, you don't have a camera on, but I'm assuming you have audio. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, can you hear me? Loud and clear. What's your question, bro? Um, well, I just, before the train wreck, right, this is an issue. For me personally, I'm in my 50s. I've already been through the divorce grinder. Mm -hmm. I have already been run through this thing. And, um, you know, it's behind me now about, I guess, five, six years. But the biggest thing for me that would have, I guess, reoriented my thought process is to quantify the cost of what it would happen in the future. And that is the lawyer fees, the property split, how much you have to pay to cash out your ex, what part of the pension you're going to lose 
uh, the monthly cost of support. And for instance, with me, it's two grand a month. So mm-hmm. I'm, I'm shoveling 24 grand a year to my ex for support. And over time, that adds up into a huge, 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 big nugget of, uh, of wealth, of missed opportunity and, and, and wealth that you're just basically has been extracted from you. And a lot of folks, they never understand when they're on the front end of getting married, it's all happy, go, you know, mm-hmm. um, they're full of love and everything's going to be great and et cetera, et cetera. But when you really get into it and you boil it down, and I think that's what you've done in a lot of ways. But one of the things I think you might have missed is that you really got to point out the numbers. You know, here is what it's going to cost you if you don't plan accordingly. You know, th- this is the potential that th- that is the downside. Yeah, I've actually covered that in a couple of videos, and I covered it in an entire chapter in my book. Um, but for those of you guys watching right now, like if you're a guy that's making two hundred thousand dollars a year, and you're Steve from accounting, or you're Kevin from the you know the head of the sales team, and you got a good living going on, and you run into Sally, who's the hairdresser, the nail salon clerk, the front desk at the insurance company, and she's making thirty, forty thousand dollars a year, she's down over here when you meet her. Sorry, I got to kind of tilt a little bit towards the camera. You're up over here. You improve her lifestyle. She comes up over here. But by the time you get divorced and that relationship ends, depending on how long you've been with her, you have to maintain her. She doesn't go back down to hair, hairdresser lifestyle. You have to maintain that lifestyle for her. That's the way that family law works. So you have to understand that if you're going to get married and invite the state in your house, it's going to decide what happens with your money. And it's you're going to be treated like tax cattle and your money will flow over to her. Well, I have talked to young men that were, you know, making the, the, I guess, the decision to get married. And I've talked to other friends and family that have been through the ringer. Mm-hmm. And there's always this sense of look at the lost opportunity. You know, look what happened to me, the lost opportunity, what it's cost me over time, how it's, you know, basically affected my life. Mm-hmm. And that's the only thing that I have been able to really um, express to other folks other men and to get them really to understand or to kind of have the light bulb come on and go you know tap the brakes uh you know maybe i need to tap the brakes on this or somehow go talk to a lawyer get a prenup or whatever the scenario is but um that's just one of the things that i just wanted to add i have uh, been a big fan of yours i've uh, you know, obviously, I, I came through the ringer. I I don't know when I happened upon your channel, but I've soaked up all of your video, all of uh, Rollo's stuff, and the other mm-hmm. guys in your uh, in your community as well. And so it's been very positive for me. Just like that other gentleman from New Jersey was talking earlier. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I wasn't um, in his frame of mind, but I got run through the through the ringer pretty bad, and um, it it basically um, was very uh, taxing uh, emotionally, mentally, financially. Um, you know, time, uh, everything. And just, you know, you, go, you, you get drug into a court and they're divvying up your property and your income like it belongs to them. And yeah. that's one of the things that you've always said is that get the state out of your, don't put yourself in the position to be there in that moment where the state, a judge and lawyers are sitting there divvying up all of your hard work, your life's work. And, um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a sobering moment. It's, it's a very, a uh, sobering moment to find yourself in. And I've been there. I've been mm-hmm. run through the ringer. I have three sons, by the way, and I know you're talking about that earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, it's been an honor for me to be a father to them. Uh, and at the same time, I get your point about not having, wanting to have sons as hard as uh, as, as crazy as things are out there today and with, with all the dynamics that's going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, if you can red pill your sons at a young age, you're you know, you're doing good. Take them, take them to a divorce court when they're 19, you know, spend an hour in there and let them see what happens to men, man. Well, the hardest uh, thing to brutal. do for men is to take good advice. The yeah. hardest thing to do is to take good advice. And the other thing that I've learned too, is time heals all wounds. Mm-hmm. Time heals all wounds. And, um, you know, over time, eventually y- it'll work itself out. The energy dissipates, um, people, you know, they don't think with their emotion, they start thinking with rational, you know, reason. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, over time, again, it just it heals all wounds, but it's tough to get through and to see the other side of that thing, like that gentleman from New Jersey. Mm. Um, and I have one last comment too, uh, Rich. Just um, yeah, go ahead. I, you know, you remind me of setting up an online fight club, just like the movie with Tyler Durden, mm. an online fight club, except it's for men to come in here and share each other's. Um, 
you know, experiences and this kind of thing and, and bounce ideas back and forth. And just basically, it's that version of it. it that, that's what it reminds me of. And that's the, one of the things that has always attracted me, and I really enjoy that, mm. is that um, you've got a wide variety of demographic and men in here that come in here and they share and they offer, uh, you know, a lot of their experiences. And it, it really adds value. Uh, you know, it really just really adds value. And it just, um, it, you are helping people. You know, whether you, and I know you know it, so. Yeah, um, thank you. You know. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Yep. Have a good night, brother. Take care. Yep. Thank you. Thanks good thanks luck for sharing on your book. stories. Um, we're going to do one more. Uh, I'm going to grab AEO, and you're in the stream. How you doing? Hi, Richard. What's up, man? Nice to meet you. Um, basically, I was just wondering, um, it's very difficult as a man to go through life, because I've realized one of the things, I'm relatively young, I'm only 23, mm -hmm. but one of the things I've realized is that men struggle to d distinguish between their philosophy and their biology. So it's, it's very difficult because I, f I feel like as men, our philosophy wants nothing to do with women because their goals and their aims are completely different to us. Whereas obviously biology and the, the almost like, disparity between each other it pulls us to each other they complement it obviously women complement us and they and we complement them the rationality the the, the the two differences but mm. i know you talk about mental point of origin how do you emphasize your rationality and focusing on your principles as a man to get you through life and don't let the biology pull you. I know you talk about beta-sization by a thousand concessions. And the difficulty is hindsight is usually 2020. So it's like or maybe 10, 20 years into a marriage, you realize what this woman's done to you. It's, it's just, uh, well, it astonishes me. Yeah, first I want to say this. I mean, I'm glad there's younger guys than me, 23, 21. I've I've even seen teenagers, you know, call in on the show and they're like, Yeah, I'm 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 really glad you're talking about this because this makes sense that I need to learn these things. So I don't end up like you rich or you know do some of the dumb shit that you did rich um or the other guys that share their stories on all these you know shows whenever i do the call-in segments but um it's hard like i'll be honest with you like when you when you live like i'm i'm closer to 50 <laughs> than i am you know to 40 now and you know i've been walking around on this planet for a long time and i've got i've got software programming you know my belief system that leads me to still try to fight you know what the truth is that the red pill brings you know that's that, that that's that's the thing that i i found so astonishing it's like everything in principle you know to put yourself as the mental point of origin yeah but i mean if you I'm spent it, 40 years as a plugged in you know pleb you're 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 still going to struggle to put yourself first. Like you're still going to do things that put women first, you know, stuff like that. Um, you know, you're still going to look at societal norms and still think that this is, you know, this is normalized because for the most part society, you know, for, kind of for the most part, again, you know, treats men as disposable objects and women are the protected sex. And that's just the way that things are. Again, you know, they tell guys to do what's right. They tell women do what's right for you, girl. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's a it's a completely different social order um, that we live in as men and we experience in as men versus the Disney movies that we were watching as kids. It's totally different. Like women are not what we've been told that they're supposed to be. They're not sugar and spice and all things nice. You know, you ask any guy that's been through the divorce grinder, they'll tell you flat out, the woman I married is not the woman that I divorced, right? And then um, if you speak to them whilst they're in marriage. <laughs> yeah you won't be able to get a word into them because it's like, oh yeah, it's fine. She, and then in hindsight, it's like she was the, 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 the You know, the best thing that you can do is just go out there, consume the material, you know, read the books, learn what you need to learn, but stay mm -hmm. focused and true to yourself and make sure that you, like, I can't stress this enough. Like, I really can't stress this enough. Like, like I dedicated the book itself to men out there that didn't have a strong masculine male role model growing up that could teach them all of these lessons that I learned throughout my life that I screwed up on. So 
if you embrace it and you know, some people will point and sputter, you're a misogynist. Oh, you have mental issues. You know, they'll make up all kinds of crap, whatever. Of course, of course they're going to default to that when you move off the beta path. Like when you get off the plantation, they don't want you to get off the plantation. They want you uh, plugged into the societal lies, right? Like they want you plugged into the nonsense. So when you start moving in a slightly different direction that makes yourself your own mental point of origin, people will challenge you at that. So that's when you know that you're on probably the better path of the two. It's just, you have to keep checking yourself, man. Like every day you got to check yourself, like with everything that you do with women that you interact with, you know, with your friends. And once you get red pilled, like you'll notice around the holiday season, like around, you know, Christmas, Thanksgiving, whatever, when you get together with family and there's a large group, well, you know, large, Oh, you have to cap your gatherings at 10 because, People are going to die if you don't, whatever. We'll skip that for now. But, you know, when you're around family and friends in larger groups, like you'll start to notice like, holy crap, like that's like these two people have been married and she treats them like that and he puts up with it and he, and he does all of those stupid things that I know don't work, right? And that's the thing. Like how it's, it's so difficult to try and, especially when you care for someone, <laughs> it's, it's difficult to try and, allow the person the key to is, see the key is is you have to care for yourself more you have to love yourself more yeah because i mean if you're not the best version of yourself you're you're going to be useless to a woman you're going to be useless to children if you want to have them women don't stay with guys that don't respect themselves women will s subconsciously try to beta tie men through a thousand concessions to turn them into a beta plow horse pleb and she doesn't want it it's not it's not what sexually arouses her or or something that she wants to be married to but that's just what women do right just like women are hypergamous just like women are solipsistic that's what they do and when you know what they're doing and you have good frame in the relationship it's it's not that much of a problem right like i'm in a non cohab ltr with my girl i've known her for quite a few years now and you know my frame gets tested and sometimes i have to check myself and check my own frame but I got a great relationship. You know, it's the same thing with like when I hear Rolo talk, the dude's been married for, I don't know, 23, 26 years, whatever it is, forever. He's got a great relationship with his wife. I've seen him and his wife interact when I've met them, right? Like uh, she's definitely in his friend. So, you know, can you have great relationships with women? Like you said earlier, men and women should be complementary to one, you know, one another. It's just not many. And, and it's incumbent upon men to know how to do that. Women don't know how to do it. You can't expect them to lead. There's no equality you know, men and women are not equal. Okay. Men, men must, men, men must lead the relationship and have her enter in, into his frame. Um, but those things are difficult to do. And some people don't want to do the work. Some people say it's impossible to do the work. There's all kinds of examples and stories that you hear from like the doom pillar guys that are like, well, you know, if Johnny Jeff can do it, then what makes you think you can do it sort of thing? Or you can't out, out alpha the state. Um, you know, there's all kinds of lyrics that you'll hear out there, but it's like, yeah, it's work and it's dressed in overalls and it looks like work and you know, that's what it is. Right. But if you have a good woman, that's a compliment to your life, not the focus, she will, you know, cook you food. She will clean up for you. She'll do your laundry. She'll, you know, she'll wake you up with a Hummer from time to time. There's all kinds of great things that come out of that synergy with that relationship. If you can manage the frame of a relationship, well, some guys can't do it. Some guys can, you know, it is what it is. But, yeah. it's, but it always boils down to mental point of origin. It always boils down to loving yourself more than you love anybody else. Yeah. I, I, I struggle to distinguish that from narcissism, narcissism a lot of the time. You have it's to like... be a little bit, hang on a second, you have to be a little bit narcissistic as a guy. There's there's nothing wrong Completely. with having a like a little dose, a, a little peppering. It's like seasoning on your steak, right? You know, you're not going to shower it in salt and pepper. You're going to season it with little, you know, something, something. It's like you got to season yourself a little bit of narcissism. You have to put yourself forced. Dude, I remember when I was dating my single mommy, when I did the same story that I started with, um, you know, after my divorce. And, um, you know, one of the things that she said to me when I wasn't doing shit that she wanted for her and for her kids was, oh, you're narcissistic. And I'm like, what? Because I don't want to do dumb shit that doesn't serve me. Right. And I wasn't even red pilled then. Right. Like I was just I was just an, a plugged in alpha. Right. Um, but uh, like stuff like that is going to happen and society, women, your employer, the government, 
you know, shit you watch on TV, your family is always going to try to shit test you to try to, you know, get you back into your nice little quiet corner, go and do your stuff and don't say anything, AEO, pay your taxes and shut up. And that's what they want men to do. And when men start to learn that they can put a priority on themselves, that they can love, you know, themselves more than they love anybody else. And that that does serve them and their family and women that might be in their lives better. It's all good, man. It's all uphill. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. All right. I will wrap good it up on that you. note, man. Thanks for uh, hopping on. Cheers. Thank you. See you all right. right. Peace. All right, guys. Um, I'm going to wrap it up. I got to go over to my men's community. We're doing a uh, private Zoom tonight on investment strategies. If um, you guys are in the community, I'll see you guys very soon. I'll drop the link on the Facebook page. Uh, if you haven't got the book yet, it's on Amazon. Uh, it's pretty much available throughout most of the world. There's some places where you won't be able to get it just yet. I'm working on a um, print to order option on my website soon. So if you live in I had a guy message me from Qatar and Ethiopia and he's like, I want to get your book. I can't get it. How do I get it off Amazon? Um, I'm working on a solution, so stand by. And with respects to the Audible version, a lot of guys are you know, in the camp of, I like to listen to my books. I'm that guy too. Uh, I plan on recording the audio myself in my own voice for the book, uh, but I'm not going to get to it right now. I've, I've been super busy, so that'll be uh, a project for next year. So I'll have the Audible version next year. So yeah, check that out. Uh, let me grab the link real quick and I'll drop it in the chat. Actually, the link's pinned in the top description below, in, in the top comment below. It's the top link there where it says get the book. So hope you guys enjoyed the show. Real quick shout out to uh, Grondike Soap Company. They've been a longstanding supporter of my channel and the content that I create. Without guys like that, without super chats and stuff like that, it makes it very hard to do this. So if you've enjoyed it, support the channel. Uh, Tactical Soap is hand sorry, handmade, pheromone infused. Uh, soaps. They also have these uh, sticks, which match up with the soaps as well. They're little, they almost look like deodorant sticks and you kind of screw them out. You just kind of touch them up on your neck, or your wrist if you want. Um, so you don't actually need the soap if you don't want, but you can just get the uh, pheromone sticks. They have beard oil, all kinds of great stuff. And I got to grab, I forgot to put the banner up for that, of course. Where is it? There it is. There it is right there. So you can just go to coopersoap.com or again, it's pinned in the top comment. If you click this link, the coupon code's already applied. If you go to the um, link that's pinned at the top, it's just um, check out with coupon code Cooper. You get the 10% off that way. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. Uh, got lots of stuff coming out this week and make sure you smash a like, leave a comment below if you have a topic suggestion for before the train wreck. See you guys in the next one.